Hey, it's Kyle Meredith with a uh, bonus edition of Kyle oh, Meredith right. with. I've been cleaning out my vaults recently, finding some of the interviews that had never made it to the uh, to the web and putting them up. Uh, one of the ones I definitely wanted to get out there finally was an interview that I did with Lenny Warnker. He was the president of Warner Brothers Records for quite a long time. We shot this, I believe, in 2017. That's right, 2017. Uh, at uh, the Warner Brothers offices, which uh, actually they're, they're no longer there. These are the Warner Brothers music offices. They've been in for decades. Uh, they moved uh, right after this to a spot in more uh, downtown Los Angeles. So what we got to do was uh, have him take us around some of the most important spots inside the Warner Brothers music offices and tell stories, not only of the rooms, but of the, uh, the artists that he helped uh, shepherd into the mainstream. Artists like Prince, like Tom Petty, like Chris Isaac. You're going to get all that and more in this interview. It's Kyle Meredith with Lenny Warrenker. You know, once you start working on the record label side and not being a musician, I mean, that's signing up for the business side of things. So what was the learning curve for you on that? Well, I learned that just by having, the, you know, working with songwriters on demos and having tremendous rest restrictions in terms of making a good demo because you could only spend a couple hundred dollars doing it and um, you'd have to find musicians that were young and up and coming. But I was lucky, you know, I ran into uh, Jimmy Gordon and Dr. John and Leon Russell. And so the demos started to get good. And we, we learned how to do certain things with those restrictions. Um, and it taught me how to sort of make a record. And so I'd come Finish, you know, a demo or whatever, and I'd come here. There were two guys working here, Jim, Jimmy Bowen, who uh, was a legendary producer, executive, you know, whatever. Dick Glasser was terrific, who I knew, because uh, he started at Metric Music. Uh, and um, I'd go around town and try to sell my little demos. Uh, and they needed help. Um, the Warner guys, Warner Reprise guys, and um, they liked the demos, so they, they wanted to hire me. I think, you know, uh, there was a lot of common beliefs. I believe that uh, early on, because I grew up with Randy Newman, so when you grow up with somebody and you hear every song and you see it keep getting better and better and better, you really learn a lot about trusting the artists if they're really good. And I believed in them, believing in somebody, betting on somebody, and uh, allowing them to do what they do best is probably the best way to do That's it. That's the way to go. Yeah. You're doing less work. When you start comparing musician to musician, the sounds have changed so much. I mean, if we're just looking at this wall behind us, you know, these are so many different sounds. But there's got to be a common thread when you're looking for what makes a good artist, what makes a good song. There's a few things. Um, point of view, personality. I think all great artists have one thing in common, and that is they're incredibly competitive with themselves. Mm -hmm. they, they just want to be the best, and they want to do the very best work. And the good ones know when it's honest and when it's not, when it's not real. It's the only responsibility an artist has, the only true responsibility as an artist, is to tell the truth. Yeah. You mentioned to me earlier, as we look up at this wall, you see uh, Chris Isaac up here. Tell me a good Chris Isaac story. I'll tell you a good Chris Isaac story, only in, only in that it shows how much all of us know. Mm -hmm. um, he and his producer, Eric Jacobson, who was a friend of mine, who I respected and still, I really respect him. Um, they were fun guys. And, when she got to know Chris, she liked him. Mm -hmm. And he was just a terrific character. So anyway, um, he wanted to uh, put out uh, Wicked, Wicked Game, what is it? Wicked, yeah, Wicked Games. Yeah, yeah Wicked Game. <laughs> and he had heard that I didn't like it. And so he and Eric, because Eric wanted to be there to support him, they called me and I said, it's true, uh, you know, I don't get it. And I, I was having trouble with a certain chord progression, which, you know, none of us like everything. Sure. 
and none of us uh, obviously know in this business uh, know very little. And I, I remember saying, look, this may be my problem. And if you guys feel that strongly about it, because you're betting on two people who you really respect, mm -hmm. you go. And then, of course, I got to call him three weeks later and he said, I told you so. <laughs> but I, it's, it's a fun story to tell, and it's not uh, any kind of fake humility. It's just reality. I don't care who you are. Um, in, in, in my case, I feel good only because I was able to step aside mm -hmm. and allow something to happen and not get in the way because of my own personal issues, mm -hmm. you know, with some chord changes or whatever. It's a mistake. So I learned a lot from that. Spot where we're sitting right now, the patio yeah. side of the Warner Brothers. Uh, Warner Brothers Records here. I've heard that lots has happened in this, including a lot of shows. You guys put on shows out here. Like yeah. the artists come in, play for yeah. the staff. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. one of those was, was Prince. Yeah, it was amazing. We had a sort of an embarrassing meeting with him about, it was always about, you know, can you hold back a bit? which he couldn't do. He was more cut out for today, mm -hmm. you know, in an odd way, because he was nonstop. And, um, you know, you try to manage that by saying you want to keep the mystery and you, you know, you don't want to oversaturate, all that stuff. And uh, in his case, uh, couldn't really do it, couldn't turn him off. You know, we, we, we believe we were, you know, doing the right thing with somebody who we, you know, had enormous respect for and admiration. Mm. There, were, there was never a time that anybody uh, lost sight of that. They knew how, how great he was. Um, one of the reasons this company is great is you had people in different areas that were really professionals, that knew their stuff. And uh, in Moe's mind, if you hire somebody, uh, and you do your homework and you know there's, there's a good chance that, that person's going to be really good, let them do it. Mm -hmm. Stay out of the way. I can remember meetings where Mo would be sitting in there and just taking notes, never said a word, you know, unless it got nuts. And that, that happened from time to time. But that kind of philosophy is similar to the philosophy about artists. Mm -hmm. Allow your people to do what they do, you know, and, and uh, bet on them. You know, we're talking about Prince and, I mean, what was it about this guy? What was it that you saw in him? You know, because again, you're talking about an artist with a sound that isn't, you know, it's not like you're just jumping on a bandwagon at that point. There was no one else doing what he did. What did you, what did you hear in this guy that made you go? The way it was presented uh, really affected me. There was a, a tape at that time. And there were, I think, seven, eight, nine songs, most of the first album. He played everything. Now, today, kids can do that easily, you know, the technology. The only person that could get away with that 1978 or whatever it was, was Stevie Wonder. Nobody else could really, really do it um, in, in a convincing way where you could you could hear the musicianship, mm -hmm. literally hear it. Uh, uh, you know the songs are good, uh, or at least very promising. But the the power of the presentation was overwhelming. Yeah, that is. Yeah. And did you realize Purple Rain when he brought it to you? Like, could you have guessed that that album would become what it is now? Did, did yeah. you hear that at the beginning? Look, I, when, when it comes to selling multi-million albums, I, you know, no. Yeah. Never. You know, I, I, I don't, I try not to think that way. Did I think it was going to be successful? Yeah, I mean, the record was really good. He came in just looking great, you know, mm -hmm. black suit, and, uh, just, you know, the real deal. And he's standing there and he said, look, uh, I don't have a base on this thing. And uh, I don't know. And I said, well, just out of curiosity, why didn't you put a bass on it mm. without hearing it? Just, he said, well, you know, when I do these things, I start building them, you know, one thing at a time, and it builds and builds and builds, and when it feels done, it's done. And it felt done. 
So I'm thinking, please, just please love what you're going to hear. Because, you know, I knew that that's what he wanted. But it was one of those rare times where he, he got nervous. Yeah. So I put my head inside these speakers almost and turned it loud, turned it up as loud as I could without making it ridiculous. And the first 16 bars, eight bars, whatever, you could hear enough action between the bass drum and what he was doing on his guitar that it, it, it covered that area. Mm -hmm. And it also added, a, by not being there, it added some space that was, made it odd. You could hear all those wonderful background parts he was doing and how he literally built the record. If you listen to it, each, each verse changes. Um, it starts with maybe a single voice, to two harmonies, three harmonies. Mm -hmm. Every, everything counted, but it had this power. And um, I got lost in it. So I, I, I wasn't even, you know, I forgot about the bass thing, mm -hmm. which tells you something. So I, I, you know, in one of my pretend courageous moments, uh, I looked at him, I said, well, look, you know, if you want to add a bass, I suppose you could do it, but if it was me, I just put it out and I threw the cassette out. And then he left and I got crazy, you know, it's, oh my God. And then we, you know, I think three, four, maybe a week later. It was on the radio. Yeah. I remember hearing it the first time and going, <laughs> you know, as beautiful as this is, they somehow decided that my office should have a pit. You walk, in, walk down two steps and then there's couches. And I never got it. I, 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 you know, it didn't make any sense to me. I had my desk and then I had to walk around. I, no. But there were some amazing meetings that went on in that, in that office. Um, the ANR staff was made up of mostly record producers. And uh, the producers that were on that staff had uh, a lot of success. You had one room, and in that room would be Ted Templeman, who was responsible for signing Van Halen and the Doobie Brothers. I get a little credit for that, but he was really Teddy. And um, produced Van Morrison. I mean, he was am amazing. Mm -hmm. And then uh, right across was uh, Russ Teitelman's office, who uh, did a lot of work with me because I like to co-produce, and then he went off on his own when I became president and did Stevie Winwood and all the big Clapton records. He's a great producer. And then you had Gary Katz, who's a Steely Dan guy, and Steve Berry, who was a pop guy, but really smart. Steve Berry, you know, and Gary to a certain extent were helpful in the Prince situation because I respected those guys, and um, uh, they both felt there's crossover hits on this thing. And I said, yeah, good. But when Time, Time and Warner became one, all these executives thought there should be a, a, a coming together, the two companies. So we went to Lyford Keys and, and uh, Time did their dog and pony show and we did our dog and pony show. And by far, the best presentation uh, was done by this guy, Dick Scully from Time Magazine telling us about uh, uh, what it was like during the week for those people that were involved in Time. And the major issue was always the cover. And it, it would start on Monday, and by Wednesday they had to figure it out. And it's an unbelievable story of what was going on and how they put that thing together in, in days. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is a first class, you know, uh, writer and, and um, journalist. He covered the Kennedy assassinations and he did a whole thing on Sun Records and stuff. So, and, and he looked like, you know, he looked like a journalist in a little bow tie and whatever. It's just a great looking guy. Uh, so anyway, at night they tried to get us all, you know, at dinner to sit together. And um, I was sitting next to Bob Pittman, 
and, and we start talking about the Black Album. Um, and I was explaining to him what we had to go through because Prince calls up one day and you know, we're in the middle of Sign of the Times, which was kind of a comeback record for him. It was big and very important. And he, he calls me, which means he's trying to, he doesn't want to talk to Mo. He's finessing. And he said, uh, you know, I go to clubs and they don't play my music. And uh, I said, uh, you, you got to be kidding me. You, you know, he, he basically said, I, I've, I've done an album, it's, it's, it's a dance record, and uh, nobody will know, we'll sneak it out. And I said, Prince, there's no fucking way. I mean, I remember saying that to him. And he said, no, we can do it, and, you know, and he, whatever. And I said, I don't think it's possible. And then he calls Mo, and ultimately, because he had power over us, he talked us into it. And at the last moment, uh, he decided to pull it. Anyway, I'm telling Pittman this story. You know, there was a lot more stuff that went on that I've forgotten now. And this guy, Dick Scully, was sitting next to me. And he knew of Prince, obviously, at, this, at that time. And he's listening and listening. And then he leans over and he said, you know, I covered the Sun Sessions. And I looked at him and I said, wow, that's amazing. Not knowing who he was. I mean, he's probably the most talented guy in the room. And... Um, at the very end of the dinner, he said, can I get one of those black albums? And what happened was we had to destroy them. We, uh, the deal that Prince made was, I want, I want this album out, then he backs down, there's 400,000 records pressed. And um, I, I think he actually wrote a check or something, I can't remember. Uh, but I remember saying to, uh, guy who used to work here, Rick Wietzma, said, get about a thousand of them, just hide them. So um, we, I knew there was a stash. Mm -hmm. So um, I can't remember, oh, I know what it was. This guy, Dick Scully, kept writing me these little letters and they, I promise I won't say anything, shh. I said, <laughs> and finally I just, you know, Screw it, you know, he's a journalist. Um, so I called Wiesman, I said, can you bring me, do you have any black albums, can you get me one? He said, yeah. So I was about to send it to him, and I had it on the top of my desk, which is, I mean, my desk now is a, is a drag, but in those days it was like W.C. Phil's movie or something. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, so there sits the black album, and in walks Prince. Unannounced, <laughs> except it wasn't Prince, it was Kim Bassinger. They were working on Batman, mm. and they, I think they became friendly. And um, she walked in and she, she just, uh, she looked great. I mean, clearly, short dress, they were doing a thing. And he was right behind her, and I couldn't tell. And then he walked in, and I had heard that he had done a remix on a song called, I think, Scandalous, I'm not sure. Anyway, it, it was about nine minutes long, a uh, nine minute long, whatever, and he, he extended it to like 19 minutes, and the last five or six minutes was just her moaning and groaning as he was doing whatever he was doing. And I'm thinking, oh man, you know, he said, I got something for you. And I, and I think, oh, it's 19 minutes, how am I gonna do this? So I, I said, well, okay, let me hear it. You know, it, it was, She's sitting right in front of me, legs crossed, you know, and, and he's having a, you could just tell he was having a great time. <laughs> and Mo walked in as we're listening to this thing. And uh, he comes over, he was really good about this stuff, he, about nine minutes into it or whatever. He just said, that's, you got it, that's, uh, you don't have to listen to all of it. And then he looks on my desk and he goes, what's that? He saw the Black Album a million great records that Warner's put out through the years. Wildflowers, for me, that's a top five record. Mm. Tom Petty. Yeah. How does it happen that he ends up at Warner Brothers? It's, in, it's interesting. Um, I don't think he was happy at uh, MCA and uh, wanted to come over to Warner's. Um, I think that Mo had uh, had conversations with his manager, and it was clear that uh, 
there might be a way that we could sign them, but we'd have to be incredibly patient and also closed mouth, which is almost impossible in this business. So uh, there were five people that were involved in this signing, at least four or five. There was Legal Affairs, Mo, myself, Tom, and Tom's manager. That's it. So the deal was done. I negotiated the deal. And then everybody was, didn't want to say anything because he had two albums to go. Mm -hmm. And um, he, uh, he didn't want to hurt himself because if MCA found out, they wouldn't care. And they, you know, just put the albums out because they had no future. Mm -hmm. So it was probably the best kept secret in rock and roll from a record company standpoint.